Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Deepa Halaharvi. I'm a breast surgeon with Ohio Health. Thank you for jo joining the first live virtual event, and the topic is breast cancer screening and prevention. I'm a board certified surgeon and MD Anderson Cancer Network certified physician. I practice at Grant Medical Center, Dublin Methodist Hospital, and Riverside Methodist Hospital, as well as Ohio Health Pickerington Medical Campus. I'm also the Associate Program Director of the Breast Surgery Fellowship at Grant Medical Center. I completed my residency in general surgery at Ohio Health Doctors Hospital, and my fellowship was at Grant Medical Center. I also happen to be a breast cancer survivor. So today my goal is to talk about breast cancer risk factors, screening for breast cancer, prevention of breast cancer. Thank you for attending this evening. Uh, please post any questions you have in the chat and we will answer those in the Q&A after the presentation. And once again, thank you for joining us. Breast cancer screening was way down during the COVID pandemic last year. It does not mean that the cancer goes away the cancer cells start to divide and multiply even though we have a pandemic going on. Cancer doesn't quarantine itself or shelter in place and neither should you regarding your breast health. In the United States, estimated new cancer cases in 2020 were about 1.8 million cancers. In 2021, we estimate 1.9 million new cancers in both men and women. The most common cancer in men is prostate cancer and breast cancer in women, followed by lung and colon cancer for both the genders. The lifetime probability of developing a cancer for female is one out of three. For breast cancer, we say one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. Breast cancer is not only the most common cancer in the United States, but it's also the most common cancer in the world. There are some breast cancer facts I would like to start with. Like I said earlier, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Every two minutes, a case of breast cancer is diagnosed. It is the most common cancer in the United States as well as worldwide. Every 13 minutes, a woman dies of breast cancer in the United States. And I'll be talking about how to reduce the risk in just a little bit. For men, of all cancers diagnosed, 1% are men, and they usually get diagnosed with a mass that they feel or a nipple discharge or skin changes, very similar to women. Unfortunately, their diagnosis is much later than women only because men don't think of breast cancer. So some facts in the United States in 2021 we estimate about 282,000 women to get diagnosed with breast cancer and 2,650 men, and of which about 50,000 men and women will have DCIS or the non-invasive cancer. And the breast cancer related deaths are about 45,000 in both men and women. Unfortunately, it is the second leading cause of cancer related death after lung cancer. Let's look at here, right here in Ohio, 154 women are diagnosed with breast cancer, and unfortunately, 35 women will die every week. Let's look at the estimated deaths in the US in 2020. The most common cause of death for both men and women was lung cancer, followed by prostate cancer for men and breast cancer for women. And the most com this next most common cancer causing death is colon cancer in both the genders. What is breast cancer anyway? It is abnormal growth of cells. It is always caused by genetic abnormality, a mistake in the genetic material. However, not all cancer is inherited. Only five to 10% is inherit inherited from mother and father. 90% of the cancer is acquired. It's wear and tear of life and is what we call sporadic cancer. It can start in any part of the breast. It could be in the ducts or lobules. Ductal cancer is the most common, followed by the cancer found in the lobules, which makes the milk in the breast. So what is a risk factor? It is something that may raise your chance of getting a disease. It does not mean you will get the disease. And we'll look at various risk factors. 
gender, being a female puts you at a risk 100 times more likely that you'll get breast cancer. Increasing age in women as women gets older, that's another risk factor for breast cancer. It's more common in Caucasian race. However, breast cancer is very aggressive in African Americans. A woman who has a personal history of breast cancer has a risk of getting breast cancer about 0.5% per year for the rest of her life. For women who have taken hormone replacement therapy, a combination of estrogen and progesterone, for more than five years, when they're going through menopause, can put a woman at risk for breast cancer. Having a first degree relative can increase the risk of breast cancer, as well as having an atypical breast biopsy, such as ADH, ALH, or LCIS. Obesity puts you at higher risk for breast cancer because of deposition of estrogen in the fat cells. And also dense breast tissue puts you at risk for breast cancer. Looking at the menstrual history, a woman who has early menarche or having periods less than 12 years of age or late menopause, more than 55 years of age or late first pregnancy after age 30 uh, can put a woman at risk for breast cancer because they just have so many more periods in their lifetime. Pregnancy and breastfeeding are protective because it does break down menstrual periods. Nulliparity or not having kids, history of radiation to the chest wall, use of tobacco and alcohol, and all of these things can be risk factors for breast cancer. But it's really important to know that genetics only plays less than 10% of the time is due to genetics. Most of the time, patients really don't have a family history of breast cancer. What are some typical symptoms women may, or men may present with? Swelling of all or part of the breast, skin irritation or dimpling, breast pain, nipple pain or nipple turning inward, redness, scaliness, or thickening of the nipple or breast skin, a nipple discharge other than breast milk, a lump underneath the arm. These are just a few symptoms, and I'm gonna go into in each of these in detail a little bit later. So let's talk about breast screening. So this can be a confusing topic. As you can see, there's a number of national guidelines which advocate screening at different ages. Some guidelines recommend getting a screening mammogram at age 40. Others recommend starting at age 50. Some guidelines recommend getting it every other year, while others recommend getting it every year. Some guidelines recommend a self-breast exam and a, a clinical breast exam, and some don't. There's also no consensus on when to stop getting imaging or mam mammography as we get older. So this is really confusing. We have so many conflicting guidelines, and certainly it's confusing for general population, and it's also confusing for us physicians as these guidelines keep changing every six months. The one thing I do wanna make sure and talk about is breast cancer is different in different races. In African Americans, it tends to be much, much younger, and it tends to be more aggressive, um, and any more women live much longer, so they may be okay to be getting mammography and not wait till age 75. So here at Ohio Health and MD Anderson Cancer Network, we recommend getting yearly mammography at age 40. And why? Because we know that earlier detection leads to better prognosis and better survival, least invasive procedures, and size does matter. And we'll get to this in just a little bit as well. So how does a patient get diagnosed with breast cancer? It's a, usually a breast mass found by the patient or the physician, a routine screening mammography that finds a mass or abnormality. So let's start talking about different modalities for breast screening. So a self breast exam, a clinical breast exam, mammogram, digital versus screen film mammography, MRI screening and ultrasound screening. I'm gonna to go to each one of these individually. A screening mammogram is performed in asymptomatic women so that disease can be detected earlier. It was first advocated in 1950s. In the United States, we recommend it, at least at Ohio Health at age 40, but as you saw earlier, there's different guidelines recommending at different time. For women at high risk, the annual screening mammogram may start at an earlier age. So today, all my talk is for women who are at average risk. So mammography is a procedure. There's eight to nine randomized control studies that have looked at it, and it has actually shown to cause decreased death rate. 
So each breast is compressed horizontally or diagonally between two plates for imaging. And there has been increased utilization of digital mammography for screening. That's what we utilize here at uh, Ohio Health. This technology utilizes a special detector capable of transforming x-rays into electronic digital image. The advantage of this over film mammography is it's faster, less callbacks, and the image can be manipulated digitally. So this is a picture of a, a routine 2D mammography. On the left, there is the up and down view called the craniocardial view. On the right is the side to side view, it's called the medial lateral view. We are also lucky here at Ohio Health to offer this 3D mammography, also called tomosynthesis. This is where the breast gets compressed like routinely, but the machine takes X low dose X-ray over an arc and it gets multiple images and it, it makes into small slices, thin slices. This allows the radiologist to look at the breast tissue that's dense. So on the left of this picture, you see a woman with dense breast tissue with a mass that's worrisome, but the worrisome mass is sort of hidden in that white dense breast tissue. On the right, you actually see right next to the arrow, that's a 3D mammography picture where you see the mass that's easily visible. We know that studies have shown the 3D mammogram or tomosynthesis has led to increased detection of cancer and decreased call rates. And it is really helpful in women with uh, dense breast tissue. And we are very excited to have that here at Ohio Health. What is a screening mammogram? A screening mammogram is performed in women who are asymptomatic. A diagnostic woman mammogram is performed in women with symptoms, whether it be mass or nipple discharge or skin changes. It can also be performed in women who have abnormal screening mammogram. And again, you see the craniocardial view, the CC view, or the MLO view, the medial lateral oblique view. Here is looking at the tissue, breast tissue density, and these are classified into four levels. On the very left, there is fatty breast. About 10% of the population have fatty breasts where a cancer is easily visible. Right next to it is fibroglandular tissue and about 40% of the population has this kind of breast. And then heterogeneously dense where you can see the dense breast tissue that's sort of whitish. And then on the way far on the right is extremely dense breast tissue. About 10% of the population has that tissue. And it's sometimes very difficult to see cancers. It can really hide well. In, and the cancer looks white. The dense breast tissue is white. So it's difficult to find cancer. But we are very fortunate to have 3D mammography. So what do the radiologists look at when they're looking at mammograms? They're looking at masses. They're looking at calcifications. They're looking at architectural distortion. A mass is something that you see on the left. It's in the left breast. It looks a little irregular. And on the right side, it's on the craniocardial, craniocardial view on the left, medial lateral oblique view on the right. And it's basically telling us that there is a mass. So this person will need an ultrasound. And most likely, if this is seen on an ultrasound, she will, he or she will get an ultrasound-guided biopsy. Calcifications are most commonly seen in women, depends on the kind of classifications. Um, these women will get a biopsy using a mammogram. 80% of the time, calcifications are benign, but it really depends on how they appear on a mammogram as to how suspicious they are. An architectural distortion is where there's a distortion in the breast tissue, as you can see, and this person will get an ultrasound as well. And if this is seen on an ultrasound, then she will get an ultrasound-guided biopsy. If this is not seen in ultrasound, then she will get a uh, mammogram-guided biopsy. Let's talk a little bit about MRI. I hear a lot about MRI, and a lot of people have questions on it. The role of this is rapidly evolving. The guidelines recommend as a supplement to a screening mammogram in women who are considered high risk, whose lifetime risk is higher than 20%. Well, today I'm talking about women that are average risk, so it really doesn't qualify unless they have family history of breast cancer, or they have breast implants, or they have what we call lobular carcinoma. So different indications for getting an MRI. The downside is it is very expensive, and there is a high false positive rate which means uh, benign masses can look worrisome and will require additional biopsies. But it is also very sensitive compared to a mammogram. It definitely has its place, and we recommend it for women who are high risk with a mutation such as a BRCA1 or 2 or other mutations, and also for women who are considered 
20% or higher lifetime risk of developing cancer. And I'm actually going to be doing another talk talking about breast cancer and high risk, and I'll go in detail as what that number means and how do we calculate that number. And this is also indicated for women who've had mantle wall radiation, chest wall radiation for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when they were, you know, in their less than 30 years of age. It's not for routine screening. It's expensive. It does have high false positive rate. People can have claustrophobia. And it's also used as a contrast called gadolinium, which can deposit in the brain. And we really don't know the long-term effects of this yet. Next, I'll talk about ultrasound screening. Um, we do have a whole breast ultrasound screening at Ohio Health. Uh, we do offer it to women who are considered moderate risk and for those women who have dense breast tissue who don't qualify to get an MRI. And this can be used as a complementary tool to mammography. And NCCN recommends ultrasound for women when they're present with a mass or thickening or some other symptoms when they're present to see the physician. The role of an ultrasound remains controversial though. But it is really good to identify solid and cystic masses to differentiate between those two. On the left here, you see a complicated cyst, and on the right, you see a mass which is irregular in shape and worrisome for cancer. It can also be used for women with dense breast tissue. Um, it is very radiology technician dependent, um, and it does not use the typical X-ray radiation. It does use the sound waves, so you don't have the radiation from X-rays. So in a nutshell, so what do we recommend here at Ohio Health? Well, we follow the NCCN guidelines, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. We're also affiliated with MD Anderson Cancer Network. And so we recommend for an average risk woman to start mammography at age 40. Size does matter as we can, if we detect cancer at an early stage, women have better prognosis and better survival. And again, this is a picture of when, you know, when you can find a mass, for a woman who occasionally does a breast exam, it has to be a size of a Brussels sprout before finding a mass in the breast. For a woman who never does a breast exam, it has to be as big as a walnut or larger before figuring out that she has a breast mass. For a woman who never does or does a regular mammogram, and it can be found as small as the size of a pea. And for a woman who does regular breast exams, the cancer can be found as small as a lima bean. So this is just some size measurements at why one should be performing a regular routine breast exam. And I'll go into that in just a little bit here and also finding cancer at an early stage. And this is why screening mammography is beneficial because we do find cancer at a smaller size and not wait for cancer to get large like this. This means the patient is diagnosed at much later stage. They will require invasive surgeries and procedures. And so let's look at the survival rates. In the United States, there has been notable improvements in screening and also treatment of breast cancer. For all comers from stage zero to stage four, the overall survival is 91%, which is pretty good compared to other cancers. So again, going back to how does a patient get diagnosed with breast cancer, and I looked at how, how we do routine mammography. Now just looking at breast mass or other symptoms found by the patient or the physician, how do we go about finding that? Before we go into that, I do want to talk about a breast self-exam and a clinical breast exam. So the difference between those two, a clinical breast exam is performed by a clinician to detect any abnormalities and warning signs. A cell breast exam is performed by a woman and should be done once a month at home. A clinical breast exam is performed by a doctor annually for women over age 40. At least every three years for women between ages 20 and 40 years of age, and that's for average risk women. More frequent exams are indicated for women who are high risk. So when should one do a cell breast exam? A woman who is premenopausal should do it a week after your periods. A woman who is menopausal, you should do it the same date every month. And a woman who is pregnant, it should be done the same date every month also. It should take no more than 10 minutes and you should perform it once a month and examine all the breast tissue. So how do you do that? You wanna stand in front of a mirror, look at both your breasts, check for anything unusual, such as nipple retraction, redness, puckering, 
dimpling or scaling of the skin, and also look for nipple discharge. Next, you can place your hands firmly on your hips, lean forward, and you can look in the mirror, and you can squeeze your hips with your arms, and that just give, tells you if there is any change in the shape of your breasts. The next thing you can do is look in the mirror, raise arms, and put the arms behind the head. It also helps and allows you to look at underneath the breasts. Then I recommend a woman place a hand over the waist of the opposite breast and roll forward and check underneath the arm to check the lymph nodes. And there's also lymph nodes above and below the collarbone. And those should be done on both sides. And then next I recommend either standing up or laying down. And the my recommendation would be to do it laying down as it spreads out the breast. And you use three fingers and you use three levels of pressure, light, medium, or firm, and you kind of go in a circular motion, starting from outer at the edge of the breast to all the way to the other side of the breast. And you just basically go in a circular motion, giving it three different kinds of pressure, a light, medium, and firm. And you wanna go all the way till you reach the nipple. And this can be done standing up, but I would recommend doing it laying down with the pillow behind your arm. This helps spread out the breast so there's more surface area to examine. So a light pressure will allow you to find masses that are superficial. Uh, a medium pressure will allow you to find that are intermediate level. And the deep pressure will allow you to find that are much deeper. And you wanna use pressure a little bit deeper. And let's look at some symptoms if you have any lumps, you should see your healthcare provider, especially if the lump feels different from rest of your breast. If the lump feels different from your other breast, if it feels different from what you felt before. If there's a change in the appearance of the breast, is a change in the outline or shape, especially caused by movements in the arm or lifting the breast. Any puckering or dimpling of the skin is also another reason to go visit your healthcare provider. Pain is typically not a sign of cancer. 95% of the time, pain is due to benign, 95% uh, of the time, pain is due to benign conditions. But less than 5% of the time, pain can be associated with cancer. So you don't want to ignore it. You do want to see your healthcare provider if you do have pain. But it is good to know that most of the time, pain is benign. If you have any nipple changes, such as discharge, if it's bloody or clear nipple discharge, uh, that needs to be seen by a healthcare provider. If there is any reddish areas, uh, any bleeding, or if any malposition in the nipple, whether it's pulling in or puckering or pointing differently, uh, you should you know, mention to your healthcare provider, as well as a rash. You know, there's what's called Paget's disease sometimes that can present as a rash around the areola. So in summary, what are some things to look for if you're thinking breast cancer? Any changes in skin color, uh, what we call pearl orange or uh, orange peel appearance, it looks like an orange peel. That's uh, usually we think of inflammatory breast cancer. Any change in the size or shape of your breast, any discharge from the nipple, whether it's clear or bloody, less worrisome if it's milky discharge, and any change in the nip appearance of the nipple. And any lump or thickening, any of these things, you should really uh, talk to your healthcare provider. So what is a good screening for breast cancer? A good breast health plan would be self-breast awareness, where you do a monthly breast exam. You ha also have a clinical breast exam, as well as mammography starting at age 40 for an average risk woman. So what are some things you can do? Know your risk, or you can start average risk, or you can start high risk. And again, I'm gonna have another talk talking about you know, high risk women and what, how we screen those women is very different than how we screen women who are average risk. What is normal for you? You know, know what lumps are normal for you. And if something changes, then you can bring attention to your healthcare provider. Get screened regularly. If you're an average risk woman at age 40, you should be getting mammography every year and make good healthy lifestyle choices. I'm going to briefly talk about prevention, breast cancer prevention. And can you prevent breast cancer? Well, have an, you really can't prevent breast cancer, but you can have an early detection plan. There is no specific way to prevent it, but we really can detect cancer at an earlier stages, and that can also lead to good prognosis and good survival. So we know that 90% of the time, breast cancer is sporadic. Being overweight, 
BMI, body mass index, of more than 25, especially in the postmenopausal time, that can put you at a risk for breast cancer. Eating unhealthy food, a diet is thought to be partly responsible, lack of exercise, exercise consumes and controls blood sugar, and it limits insulin-like growth factor. Um, it affects how breast cancer cells grow and behave. Drinking alcohol, alcohol is a carcinogen. It raises estrogen levels and damages DNA. Women tend to have more hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And smoking is linked with several cancers. What are some things that can be controlled? Well, a family history of breast cancer, high doses of radiation as a child, and previous abnormal breast biopsy, ethnic origin, where you live. These are all the things that are not in our control. Reproductive factors, when one had started their periods or when one had menopause, or maybe you don't have a control of having kids before age 30. Or maybe you cannot have kids. But some things we can control, that is maintaining our BMI in the normal range in less than 25, having kids if that's a desire for you, breastfeeding, uh, American Cancer Society recommends breastfeeding for at least a year, and moderation in drinking alcohol or maybe not drinking alcohol, and exercising, and I'll go into it as to how much exercise is adequate based on American Cancer Society recommendations. Hormone replacement therapy, that's the hormones that women take as they're going through menopause, maybe limiting the time that you take it or maybe finding alternative ways to manage the symptoms going through menopause. Let's look at nutrition and exercise. What we eat and how we live affects our risk for breast cancer. One in five cancers diagnosed in United States each year are related to the body fat, physical activity, alcohol consumption, and poor nutrition. And these are all the things that are in our control and could be prevented. So American Cancer Society recommends eating two and a half to three cups of fruits and vegetables every day, including it at every meal, including it at snacks. Eating a variety of fruits and vegetables is, is indicated. And limiting like high sugar and so choosing 100% juices if you like juices. And limiting on creamy sauces and dressings and dips and choosing whole grains instead of refined carbs. Uh, whole grain breads and pasta and cereal and brown rice over something that's more refined. Why is it important to eat more fruits and vegetables? Well, it not only helps decrease the risk of cancer, but also very helpful for high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes mellitus, obesity, and cancer. So let's look at alcohol. Having more than one to two drinks per day can raise your risk of throat, liver, colon, and breast cancers. American Cancer Society recommends no more than two drinks per day for men and no more than one drink per day for women. And what is considered one drink, it's usually not more than five ounces of alcohol per day. So that's not a lot of alcohol. So how much exercise is enough? Adults should engage in at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, which is about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise every week. And we should limit a sedentary behavior. This really hasn't been helpful with the COVID where we're working from home and we're, you know, uh, bound at home. We are lying down, watching too much Netflix. Um, we also should focus on choosing activities that are fun. I think in America, we wear sleeplessness as a badge of honor. At least I did that as I was going through my residency and fellowship. But sleeping an extra hour a night can help a woman or a man to lose weight up to 14 pounds a year. And there is also evidence that less than seven hours of sleep can increase your appetite, in turn can lead to uh, weight gain. And lack of sleep is associated with a number of other things such as dementia, heart disease, obesity, uh, you name it. How about stress and breast cancer? I get asked about this quite frequently. And I often have women, when they're diagnosed with new cancer, if, they, if I ask them about their history, they have recently have under, had a divorce or a death in a family, loss of a job. So studies have shown there is twofold increase in breast cancer risk after disruption of a marriage owing to divorce, separation, or death of a spouse. Cancer risk has shown to increase after chronic depression that has lasted for six years. Extreme stress and low social support increases up to ninefold increases in breast cancer incidence, and that's pretty huge. 
Let's look at mindfulness as a lifestyle for cancer reduction. Mindfulness-based stress reduction, a meta-analysis of about 10 studies have shown improvement in psychological and physical quality of life. It has also shown to reduce depression, fear of recurrence in women who are diagnosed with cancer. It is a great tool for emotional well-being. MRI studies of women who, who practice mindfulness have shown increased gray matter density in the region of the brain linked to memory, linked to emotion regulation, and also to empathy. And mindfulness really helps to take, helps to take care of ourselves, our emotional well-being, and which is a foundation for us to do the best work every day of our lives as we are navigating through life's ups and downs. And I want to talk briefly about breast cancer prevention in high-risk group. And like I alluded to earlier, I do have a talk coming up where I'll be talking about breast cancer prevention in high-risk groups. And uh, please be sure to tune into that talk. But there is a study called NSABPP1. This is the study that looked at women who are high-risk for women who have BRCA mutation or some other mutations, or they're simply high-risk because they had an atypical biopsy. And a tamoxifen is a drug that can be used in these women that decreases the chance of developing invasive and non-invasive cancer by up to 50 percent. And the risk reduction is much higher in women who have like atypical ductal hyperplasia, larvular car uh, carcinoma in situ. So I'll definitely go into much more detail on my next talk when I talk about high risk. And also, uh, being a surgeon, I cannot not talk about prophylactic surgery for these women who are diagnosed with a BRCA mutation. I often talk about Angelina Jolie as she's this famous actress who's diagnosed with BRCA1. She underwent a preventative breast uh, surge mastectomy on both sides. She also underwent a preventative oophorectomy or removal of her ovaries. And studies have shown removal of breast reduces the risk of cancer 90% or a little bit higher. And I'll go into much more detail when I talk about um, high risk and how we manage that. So I didn't want to leave today without giving some sort of a tangible advice, some things that you can take home today and start practicing and implementing for yourself in terms of risk reduction and prevention. So number one, so I have top 10 take home messages. I'll start with one, um, cutting out sugar. Studies have shown in the United States, Americans consume as much as 77 grams of sugar every day. This, while this may not cause cancer directly, but it is related to obesity, um, chronic inflammation, increases blood sugar levels. There's something it's very important to maybe read the labels and pay attention to what we are eating. Fiber is not very well talked about. It has, it has so many benefits, more than just you know, keep making your bowels regular. Uh, it has shown to decrease breast cancer, colon cancer, um, helps, helping with weight loss. And it's different amounts is recommended for different people based on their ages, but I would recommend at least 30 grams a day. Number three. Eating a balanced diet and avoiding processed food. Now, I'm going to be doing another talk on lifestyle and cancer, and I will go into um, what foods are helpful to prevent cancer. And I'm just going to briefly talk about it here. Um, we can incorporate some of these foods into our you know, foods every day. Uh, folate is found in green leafy vegetables, oranges, melon berries. Um, it protects not just for breast, but colon and rectal cancers. Tomatoes, which has lycopene, is associated to reduce risk of prostate and breast cancer. Green tea helps against colon, liver, breast, and prostate cancer by, by having a phytochemical. I drink green tea every day, and I've really come to like it. Uh, incorporating cruciferous vegetables into your diet, such as broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and bok choy. And those are really delicious, figuring out how we can incorporate this in our daily or meals. Uh, this is associated with the reduction in breast and some other cancers. Number four, exercise. One of the important things with exercise is you really have to find what works for you, what is fun for you. If you that's more easy to stick with. Um, and it's really, you don't have to do much more than half an hour a day. And one of the most common exercises that is underutilized is walking. Walking 30 minutes a day out in the fresh air is so important and it's so relaxing and it has so many benefits. Number five, limiting alcohol. 
And this is, I think, with the COVID pandemic, we all, you know, have been staying home. Uh, we are doing virtual meetings. Uh, we have wine meetings at, you know, whatever the wine o'clock. And so it's important to limit alcohol. No more than one drink a day for women is what's recommended. No more than two drinks a day for men. Um, is what's recommended by American Cancer Society, and it is linked with several cancers. Number six, sleep. And sleep is really important. It helps us re regenerate all the cells. Uh, it helps us store from short-term memory to long-term memory, and it's several, it prevents dementia. Uh, and there is, I'm reading a book just talking about sleep at this, at this current time. Number seven, take care of mental health. This is something I think during COVID pandemic, we found out we are depressed and anxious of anxiety of the unknown future and, and people are getting addicted to drugs and alcohol. It's really important to talk to your healthcare provider and there could also be imbalance in the neurotransmitters. You may need help with medications and there's nothing wrong with it, but make sure you're reaching out to your healthcare providers and not suffering in silence. Number eight, I think COVID taught us we are not in this together. We are in this together, sorry. So we want to surround yourself with a supportive community. It's important to have those friends, even though we can't be together in person, but we still can be together virtually. And just becoming more creative in having those family reunions or parties, or um, you still can talk to each other over the phone. And so important to make sure we are taking care of each other and helping each other because we are in this together. Number nine, mindfulness. And I said like earlier, I hope we can learn to be happy. And I think mindfulness really is one of those things that does help us to be happy. Um, it helps us with our emotional well-being, and that in turn helps us to do our best work. And life has so many ups and downs, and it helps us navigate our life. And last but not least is gratitude. And it is said it's not the happy people who are thankful, it's the thankful people who are happy. And it's really important to maybe jot down just a few things that you're grateful for for that day. And that what that does is it allows your brain to keep looking for those positive things or events that are happening for you. And it could be very simple things. Um, and that just tells you all the positive things. And it really has a great impact on your brain. And people who use utilize Gratitude Journal are more resilient to setbacks and challenges in life. And I just wanted to end talking about my own journey and I didn't go into too much detail. I'm also a breast surgeon as well as breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with breast cancer just eight months um, after I started working as a breast surgeon uh, due to a screening mammography. So I definitely will say screening mammogram did change my life and save my life. Um, as I went through this and I was diagnosed in March of 2015, it will be six years on March 27th of next month. And um, there are several personal and professional lessons I have learned over the last six years. Um, and this is my family on the right. Um, we, I have learned to spend more time with my family and friends. I've even taken vacations together. I really try really hard to live in the present moment, even though it is difficult. Uh, it's something that I'm working on continuously. Um, as a surgeon, it was hard for, and as a woman, it's hard for us to accept help. And I became more humble and was more willing to accept help from friends and family. Um, and I had a really difficult time as a surgeon to let go of control. And I still struggle with this from time to time, but I really had to learn to let go of control in order for my own healing. Um, Life is short, so there's no time for negative or toxic people, no time for drama. So I really only associate myself with people that bring me joy, that, you know, I just have a lot of happiness in their presence. Um, and so you can love the toxic, negative people from a distance. You don't have to be with them. Um, and above all, self-care and self-compassion is so important. Um, we really can't pour from an empty cup, and we have to fill ourselves in order to take care of others. And that's not being selfish. Um, professional lessons, I, this is my calling to be a breast surgeon. This is why I'm here today doing what I'm doing. I just wanna reach as many people as possible um, to educate and empower people. That's my passion, not just because of what I do, but what I've gone through. And this is my calling and my purpose in life. Um, things that have changed as a result of my own cancer diagnosis, I call patients back right away. Um, and 
I used to do that before, but even at night or weekends, I still call patients uh, because I know just waiting is very excruciating and painful. Um, and, and also, I've been very privileged and honored to take part in talks like this, got to go on TV shows and do interviews, do a commencement talk for my medical school. But really, the greatest joy that I have found is in service, in serving the community, serving the people, and helping people. And um, I also found out that we cannot develop courage without going through adversities and without facing fear. So this COVID pandemic, um, it was very fearful for all of us, but I think we all have come out hopefully a lot more braver because of this. And as a doctor, my goal is to give hope to my patients, never take hope away from my patients, whether it's stage zero breast cancer or stage four. And I always tell the residents and fellows that I train, a doctor's mission is not just to prevent death, but to improve quality of life. And when we treat a patient or when we treat a disease, we may win or lose. But when you treat a person, you will win every single time, no matter the outcome. And that's, I live by that on a daily basis. And as a result of my own journey, I not only help the patients live a quality of life and survive, but also to thrive. And again, this COVID has wreaked a havoc in all of our lives, uh, but also, you know, it also showed us that we need to take care of ourselves to improve nutrition, improve sleep, work on our mental health, uh, maybe, you know, exercise more, you know, reduce stress and you know, eliminate smoking and decrease alcohol use. And, you know, this is your life. You are the architect of your life. It's your road and yours alone. And others may walk with it with you, but no one can walk it for you. And so these changes that I talked about today, um, they not only can help your breasts, but they'll help decrease cholesterol, blood pressure, COPD, um, diabetes, help you sleep better, you know, get you in a happier mood, less dementia, and just give you a happier life and just make a happier planet. So that's all I have today. And thank you so much for your attention. And these are my references. And if you have any questions regarding anything about Ohio Health, you can call Ohio Health Cancer Call and the numbers are listed here. Um, you can also visit our websites, ohiohealth.com slash mammography and ohiohealth.com slash cancer. If you have any questions from me, I'm happy to take it and you can type it in the chat. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tim Pallotta and I'm a marketing specialist with Ohio Health. And I'm going to be moderating the chat this evening. So if you haven't already, we're asking you at this time to put your questions in the chat for Dr. Hal Harvey, and we'll direct those to her right now. So Dr. Hal Harvey, starting with our first question, um, a viewer asks, how would a woman under 40 know if they have dense breasts and that they are at a higher risk of cancer? That's a really good question. I think, um, so the recommendations don't recommend a screening mammogram under age 40 unless uh, that you have a family history of breast cancer, then you would want to start getting mammography 10 years earlier than a family member who's diagnosed with breast cancer. So that will allow you to know whether you have dense breast tissue. Um, I would say in terms of whether your average risk or high risk, you would want to go see your provider, healthcare provider, and they can help you with doing a breast exam and how to do a breast exam correctly and, and if you have a dense breast tissue. Excellent. Another question we've received is um, if someone is giving themselves a breast exam, what is the minimum amount of time that they should be taking the time to do this? I, I, yeah, I would say you shouldn't take more than 10 minutes and once a month is all I recommend doing it. You don't want to do it every day because your breasts do change depending on the cycle and the time of the month, but it should not take no more than 10 minutes once a month and just put it down on your calendar. If you're postmenopausal, if you're premenopausal, we would recommend doing it a week after your periods. Another question we have for you. What screening would be recommended for someone that had a bilateral mastectomy with cancer originally against the chest wall if they fear that a clinical exam or a self-exam might miss something? 
So uh, the recommendations are still clinical exam and a self-exam of the chest wall, and you would do it exactly like how we do a breast exam, just like how I showed earlier, just kind of putting that light, medium, and deep pressure on the chest wall. Um, but if you're worried about a mass present, obviously you should be seeing and help your uh, breast specialist, whether it's a surgeon or a mid-level practitioner, um, they should be helping you to feel these masses. And if indicated, we can always get an ultrasound or a breast MRI, depending on what we are feeling. But if you're feeling something, make sure to let your doctor know. Is nipple discharge only concerning if it happens spontaneously versus when the nipple is expressed? Yes, so that's a really good question. A nipple discharge that's bloody or clear, and if it's happening spontaneously is more worrisome than nipple discharge that's milky and it happens only when you have to squeeze your nipples. Are there areas in the United States or globally where breast cancer is more or less prevalent throughout the population? Globally? Yes. More or less prevalent? Yes. Um, so I, I really don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that in the United States, our rates of breast cancer are pretty high. We also screen women and we follow the screening recommendations. There are several countries that don't really have the screening recommendations or guidelines. Um, one of my other passions is talking about uh, breast cancer diversity, and I, there's not going to be another talk about that uh, that I will be doing, talking about breast cancer in African Americans who tend to have aggressive cancer. And the cancer in, in Africa is, is also more aggressive, more triple negative based cancer. But I exactly wouldn't be able to tell you right now as to what country is um, like worse in, in the, in globally. Okay, thank you. If someone has breast cancer, what guidelines for cancer screening should their daughter follow? So would you recommend more regular screenings? So if someone has breast cancer, uh, your daughter should be getting mammography 10 years prior to you being diagnosed. So say you're diagnosed at age 50, your daughter should be getting a mammography 10 years earlier than that, so she should be starting at age 40. Uh, obviously, she should know how to do a breast exam once a month. Uh, depending on the age, if they're between ages 20 and 40, they should be seeing a healthcare provider every three years. If they're average risk, um, if they are high risk, they should be seeing the provider uh, twice a year between a breast specialist and their uh, PCP, primary care physician. What challenges has COVID-19 presented for treating breast cancer patients? Yeah, COVID-19 really has taught us several things. Um, when COVID-19 started last year, we really did not know if you're going to be able to take patients to surgery. So there was a time where we suspended uh, elective surgeries and we were only taking patients to surgery who absolutely needed surgery. So for instance, if a patient was diagnosed with a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, uh, we were placing them on endocrine therapy, anti-estrogen pill, and kind of monitoring them. If someone needed chemotherapy, they were getting chemotherapy prior to going to surgery. So during that time, they were doing that. Um, we were taking patients to surgery who absolutely needed surgery. But having said that, our screenings, the rate of screenings were down during that time. But I also want to make sure to let everyone know it's very safe to come and get your screening mammography. Uh, at Ohio Health, we are very good about following all the guidelines and keeping everything clean. Um, but it has changed our practice of how we uh, manage breast cancer depending on their stage and the kind of breast cancer. Um, we talk about whether one should benefit from getting chemotherapy prior to going to surgery. Uh, so really it's very individual, but it, it has made a huge difference in how we take care of patients. Very good. Thank you. This person asks, if you had a nipple become inverted dur um, during breastfeeding, should you continuously be watching that? even after um, a mammogram that might have been good after that originally? Yeah, if a, if a nipple is inverted and uh, it just happens because of an, I mean, most likely in that case, if someone is breastfeeding and nipple is inverted, most likely could be like an infectious process. Uh, maybe just best to get it checked out with the healthcare provider. And I would keep watching it. If it remains inverted, it's something that needs to be worked up um, and a should be seeing a breast specialist. Okay. And do birth control pills or homo hormone therapy increase your risk of breast cancer? 
So the birth control pills, they're really low dose birth control pills. They, I mean, we really tell women it's totally safe to do birth control pills because of the low hormones in it. It, it does protect you against ovarian cancer. Now the hormone replacement therapy, you're talking about a combination of estrogen, progesterone, uh, when women take it during the menopausal time for more than five years, then that can certainly put you at a risk for breast cancer. And what survivorship care is available at Ohio Health? Yeah, our, we have a really robust survivorship. It's ran by Lisa Honan and Dr. Lilly. Um, so we send our patients and really as soon as they're diagnosed with cancer, they can go to survivorship and they follow them with their screening, their imaging, breast exams. Um, we have physical therapy, genetics. Uh, we have a dietitian. Uh, we have a number of different services. Um, they not only check for breast cancer, but they're also evaluating you, making sure you don't have not just a recurrence of breast cancer, but also looking for other cancers. So any sort of symptom management, quality of life issues, uh, sexual problems, you know, from after surgery, being on endocrine therapy, um, they're very good about helping you with those kind of things. And uh, it's, again, by Dr. Lily and Lisa Honan. Excellent. All right. So um, that concludes the Q&A section of our event this evening. And I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Hal Harvey to wrap things up for us. And thank you so much for your presentation and for your time. Thank you all very much for attending today. And I know it's a working day, weekday, and to join uh, talks like this is difficult to do in an evening time. But very, very excited to bring this uh, kind of information out to the general public. So you, if you have any questions, we can answer. Um, and I started with breast cancer screening and prevention, but I would like to talk more about lifestyle and cancer, breast cancer and diversity, and also high risk and how we screen and prevent cancer. So I really hope you join us in the future discussions and talks. Thank you very much.